Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. On this celebration of the Lutheran Reformation today, we have been focusing on Luther's small catechism that was written in, four, in 1529. And in that catechism, we've been summarizing in our service the basic teachings of Scripture. And those teachings provide us with a freedom, a freedom in Christ Jesus. And so we're going to study that freedom in Christ using the words that St. Paul wrote to the Galatian Christians in his fifth chapter, verses 1 through 6. It is, for freedom, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to you, to every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. This is the word of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So we heard the word of the Lord from Galatians chapter 5, as we're talking about it today. What a, what a neat saying at the beginning of that, dear friends. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You recognize Reformation Day is about freedom. Maybe it, it's fitting you would think, oh, maybe we should have had Reformation Day on the 4th of July. <laughs> but it's fitting that it's just a short while before Election Day, too, right? Because we talk about freedom quite a bit uh, these times as we consider the blessings of, of our nation. But we must really differentiate, be very careful to differentiate this freedom of the Reformation from the freedom proclaimed in the patriotic quotes, like the one from uh, Patrick Henry, remember what he said? Give me liberty or give me death. Perhaps you know of this quote, we want to be careful, um, there's some truth to it, but we don't need to bring it over into the church, when Franklin, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt said this, we and all others who believe in freedom as deeply as we do would rather die on our feet than live on our knees. As much as we cherish national liberty, and as much as we can be very proud and thankful of the, of the things that Patrick Henry and President Roosevelt did following through on these quotes, national liberty ultimately will fall short. And consider a movie scene, I date myself, I've used this a few times. So 25 years ago the movie Braveheart came out with Mel Gibson. And consider the, one of the concluding scenes from that movie. Uh, Scotland's fight against the oppression and tyranny of, of the King of England. Uh, Knight William Wallace led in that fight for independence. But he was captured and he was condemned to public torture and death. And the torture portrayed in the, in the movie didn't show it all, but you can just imagine it was gruesome. He refused to submit to the king. He refused to beg for mercy, which would include submitting to the king. As he's suffering the severe torture, Cries for mercy start to come from the watching crowd. Those who were at first jeering him are then saying, mercy, mercy in his stead. And as the cries for mercy from the crowd increase, the executioner leans over him and gives him one more opportunity to submit to the king and receive the relief. Instead, 
Wallace is pictured in that movie, mustering up all the energy, all of the oxygen he can get in his lungs. And they think he's going to yield, but he shouts, Freedom! And the axe falls. He's dead. It's an uh, inspiring movie for some, but as I watched that movie, I was kind of left in a depressed state. As much as freedom benefited and his, his defense of freedom benefited those around him in later centuries and his name is remembered in history, ultimately, William Wallace was dead in the end and it doesn't appear that he was a Christian from history. There was not a whole lot of freedom left for him there. It is good for us to cherish the freedom that we have in this land. It is good for us to do that. We will be exercising our right to vote in the next nine days or so, or even before if you early vote. Yet, cherish and defend our national freedom without overvaluing it. We dare not let uh, a struggle to fight or find an earthly freedom distract us from the freedom that we have already been given. The freedom declared by St. Paul in these words to the Galatians. God has freed us from sin, death, and the devil. And another way that uh, we can give up that basic freedom is what... The St. Paul was writing a, a, to the Galatians about one of the problems that Martin Luther fought about in that use of, of freedom of that day. Uh, the, of the, in the Lutheran Reformation, the devil has, had whittled his way in with false teaching regarding the gift of freedom. Saying, if you want God's gift of freedom, you have to earn it. Okay? If you want God's gift of freedom, you must it. St. Paul and then Martin Luther make it clear that the Bible, God's Word, teaches us that the freedom we have in Christ is not earned. So let's talk about Christian freedom by grace, not earned, by grace through faith in, in Scripture. Like you, the letters uh, uh, to the Galatians, the first recipients of that letter, knew the grace of God. They, had, they were well versed in the understanding of salvation by faith alone, faith in Christ Jesus. In fact, they didn't have a little book like this, Luther's Small Catechism. They didn't even have this one that some of you might have been familiar with learning, using to learn from. And they didn't even have a, a more modern one that like came out printing in the last 10 years. But they knew the basic truths of the Christian faith, just like you do. Jesus Christ came to this earth to save sinners, uh, of whom all of us are included in that group. He became fully human as God took on human flesh to be our Savior. He, he lived a holy life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He rose from the dead to assure you and me that we also have that victory over death because our sins are forgiven. That's the summary that we have, even shorter than we have in the, the small catechism. That is the freedom for which the Apostle Paul stands up, for freedom that Christ has set us free. But these Galatians had become convinced, or at least being challenged by false teachers, who said they needed to do more than just have mere faith in Christ Jesus. They had to follow certain portions of the Old Testament rules and regulations to complete the work of receiving the forgiveness that God was offering. Follow all those Old Testament rules and regulations, including, well, circumcision, a diet, worship festivals, and the like. In effect, they were telling them that what Jesus did, it wasn't enough. Paul reminds them, straight from in the words of our text today, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. 
stand up in that freedom that Christ has earned by his life, his death, his resurrection. And what is that freedom really? First of all, it's the freedom from sin. To know that when the sin, the, the guilt of sin is speaking to us about something wrong you've done and how you deserve some bad thing to happen to you because of what you've done wrong, freedom from sin means I can tell my guilty conscience, Jesus took that sin away. That guilt is removed. Freedom means that when death is at our door, or a loved one's death is, is near, we can remember the truth that Jesus died on the cross and, and rose from the dead so that we too would live with him forever in heaven. And when the devil whispers into your ear the accusation, you haven't done enough, and you think to yourself, have I done enough to make it to heaven? Have I done enough? Freedom means we can answer yes. Certainly enough has been done, not by me, but I receive what Jesus Christ did. It has been a gift to me. I am not a slave to sin and death or the devil. And so we stand up in that freedom. And Paul told those, Corinth, uh, those Galatians um, about one area where they had really fallen into. They, they were teaching the main thing that they needed to show they were doing enough to be saved well, it was to be circumcised. They all had to, as Gentiles, coming to, you know, who had been heathen, worshiping false gods, when they came to faith, the people in the church in Galatia said, well, believe in Jesus and make sure you are circumcised so that you uh, can really be a part of God's church. The Apostle Paul tells them that if they allow themselves to be forced to be circumcised, if they think that being circumcised earns them a spot before God, they're yielding all of the freedom that Christ gives. Let me just use Paul's words in, in verses 2 and 3 and 4. Look, I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who allows himself to be circumcised that he is obligated to do the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law are completely separated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Don't go back to the law as showing you the way to heaven. Martin Luther lived in a day and time when the visible church of his day had fallen prey to that same doctrine of works that the Galatians had. Believe in Jesus and do this. Believe in Jesus, but make sure that you confess every single one of your sins to the priest and then do the works of penance. Believe in Jesus, but uh, if you enter the monastery, you'll get to heaven sooner. Believe in Jesus, but if you want to get a little bit of extra credit for God, buy an indulgence that pays for additional sins and use the merits of those saints who have done enough good to have leftovers for you. Those works were things that had enslaved the church of Luther's day. And so he would say, stand firm again in freedom. Ancient history, 400, 500, or nearly 500 years ago, 495 years ago, he wrote the small catechism. What's this ancient history have to do with you and me? Well, friends, we can easily fall prey into adding laws as a way to get to heaven. Okay. You come to worship right, regularly in church on Sunday, and we usually use the same order of service or something very similar. Using that order of service is the way to show God that I'm worthy of heaven. Or it's the only way to worship God rightly. That's allowing ourselves to be enslaved in freedom again. But this order of service today, based on the small catechism, doesn't follow the normal way we do worship. It has a lot of the components, but it's all messed up and out of order from what you're used to. But that's okay. We are free to have a little bit of a different style in our worship today. We'd even be free to have an electric guitar if someone wanted to play it in a God-pleasing way. Or a drum set. Right? We can do that and still honor our Lord when done, well, 
when done recognizing the freedom we have in Christ. Stand firm. Stand firm in that freedom you have in all of those areas of life because you are not going to earn your way to heaven by obeying the laws God gives. You are not going to earn your escape from death by doing this or that. It's all that free gift in Christ Jesus. Stand firm in that freedom. But if we go to the ending verses of our text, Paul adds a little bit more as he writes to those Galatians. Looking at verse 5, he says, Indeed, through the Spirit, we by faith are eagerly waiting for the sure hope of righteousness. This freedom leads us to hope. I hope, uh, not just hope, I know that you are here because you have, because of the freedom you have in Christ, that you have that hope, that certainty of looking to heaven because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for you. Again, it's not a work that you did. And the Apostle, uh, not the Apostle Paul, Martin Luther explained in his uh, explanation of the third article about how that hope comes. Again, a free gift by God. It wasn't in our order of service today, but it is in the small catechism. And you can probably say it to yourself as I say it for you, right? I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. Friends, that is the freedom you have as the gift from the Holy Spirit, and it gives you hope, a certainty, a certain hope in the future. But then that hope leads to one other thing. Look at the final verse, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. Rather, it is faith working through love that matters. What is it that matters? Not if you're circumcised or not. It, it doesn't matter if you use the historic liturgy in worship or a newer version brought into modern, uh, a modern style. It doesn't matter if you vote a certain way or vote a different way. What matters? You go back to those commandments and those laws of God and you say, let me express my faith in a loving way. That's what he says. Faith expressing itself love. This could be another, uh, another theme of the Reformation. It, it always follows the truth that we're saved by grace alone, but after we know and have the freedom of grace uh, alone, faith alone, scripture alone being the way to heaven, then we're free to say thank you to God, following his laws in a joyful way. Letting that hope motivate us to work out love in our life. Faith alone saves, but faith without works is dead. So our works will follow. You're free to choose what profession you do in life. Doctor, mechanic, lawyer, soldier. What is your profession? You're free to choose. But as you make that choice, let love for others and love for God be your guide. You're free to vote, or actually free not to vote, too. But make sure you're making your choice out of love, not just out of laziness or selfishness. Right? Let love be your guide. Martin Luther expressed his love, and love for God, expressed his faith by writing the small catechism. Actually, a very small portion at the very front of this. It's condensed down to eight pages on a number of the things that I print. Um, very simple summary. He wanted people to understand this basic truth of Christ Jesus. And that basic truth of freedom because of the work of Jesus. I'd suggest that one of the ways that you can let faith express itself through love, the way that you can follow this verse 6 of Galatians chapter 5, is to... Use one of these books regularly in your home. For yourself. For your family. So you're familiar with these basic truths of Scripture about the way of salvation. 
about those six chief parts of the Catechism, right? The Ten Commandments. Confession and absolution, baptism, holy communion, uh, the Lord's Prayer, and the Creed. As you know these basic truths, dear friends, you are able to stand firm in your Christian freedom. May God bless us on that path. Amen.